Amen. We're going to have another session now. Father, in Jesus' name at this time, we're asking, oh Lord, you bless your people more and more in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, all the good you want us to do, all the places you are sending us, and everything we're going to get involved in, this work will prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down. As we come to this session, we're looking at spiritual cleansing and renewal by the Holy Ghost in Titus chapter 3. We're looking at verses 4, 5, 6, and 7. Titus chapter 3. And we're looking at it from verse 4. Here is what we learn. But after that, the kindness and the love of God as Savior toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration a renewing of the Holy Ghost, which is shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You will find as you look at verse 5, it talks about the washing of regeneration. And talks about the renewing of the Holy Ghost. That's why we come and we title this spiritual cleansing. In what cleansing? The cleansing that Christ does in his power by his blood. And then the renewal that comes a result, as a result of that regeneration and renewal. You will find that verse 4 begins with the word but. That word but is a transitional conjunction between the past and the present. You find the past in verse 3. And then you find the present from verse 4 onwards. And the but standing in between says... Look at the past. See what was there. And then look at the present and see what is there. By the way, he gives us seven things in the past. And then he comes on now and he gives us seven agents that brings about the renewing and the revival, the regeneration and the change. Look at the seven things he gives us in verse 3. Number one, we ourselves were sometimes, number one, foolish. That is, in our past lives, the life we lived, the acts we performed, the attitude we had, the direction in which we moved. Number one, we were foolish. Number two, we were disobedient. Or disobedient to even the normal common laws. The things that everybody knew. Self-evident truth. That we didn't need to read at much of the Bible. The truth that had been reaching upon the conscience of man. And then we were also disobedient to the revelation that comes as a result of the giving of the word of God. We were disobedient to even the things we ourselves knew and we taught others. It says, number two, in our past lives, we were disobedient. Number three is still in that verse three. It says, we were deceived. The voices we heard deceived us. The counseling we heard from people deceived us. The lives of people will follow. They deceived us, our masters and mentors. 
the people that went before us and we looked at the examples as if these are the models to follow they deceived us our own minds deceived us and it says number three look at what we were in the past foolish disobedient deceived and then it says number four you find it in number three serving divers different lusts and pleasures it said actually our our lives were not our own you might think you were free you might think you were doing what you want no you you are a slave a slave of lusts a slave of pleasures and the people the pleasure makers if we call them that the entertainers they fed fat on you the nightclubs, the cinema houses, all the people that traded on the emotion and also on the lustful desires of men, they fed fat on you because you were serving diverse lusts and diverse pleasures. And then number five, he said, we were living in malice and envy. Living in malice and envy. And that simply means that you are carrying quite a lot of load on your back. And you add a diary of offenses on your mind. And actually, you are not living for the future. You are living in the past. 19 such and such, somebody did this and that affects your action today. And seven years ago, somebody acted this way. That affects your life today. Your action, your utterances, the direction in which you are going. You are living by malice. That you are not living, you are not being motivated by a goal. Something before you. You had no goal, you had no desire, and you had no future. You are living because of the things that happened in the past. Your life was negative on Tuesday because of what happened negatively on Monday. Your life was negative on, on, on in February because of a negative thing that happened in January. You were not living for the future. You are living by the malice of what happened in the past. That's what it says. It says that's what we were. And then number six, it says we hated people. It says hateful hateful that is the hatred was just there and you know when somebody is going on like that with everything the burden of the past the malice and the envy and the jealousy and the hatred what will life amount to number seven then hating one another and then it comes on in verse four and it says but it says look at all these seven things of the past and if the Lord had left you to yourself, and you lived by what you had all in the past, and you were tied to the past in your thoughts, in your imagination, and in the direction in which you were living, and your mind almost going to the past things, don't you see what it says over there? All those seven things, but thank God for his grace, and thank God for his goodness, and thank God for the regeneration. For the renewal, for the things that come, and then there is a change. But after that, now he wants to tell us that although you had those seven things in the past that controlled you, those things in the past that would not have allowed you to move forward in the right direction, the things of the past that made your walking unsteady, unstable, unprofitable, in how comes, he says, do you see seven agents? And the seven agents that bring the change, what are they? Number one, it says the kindness of God. That's in verse four. And the first agent that brings the change and the turning around is not something coming from you. It's not coming something coming from your neighbors. It's not something earthly. That there is no tree on earth that produces this fruit. There is no chemical on earth that produces this change. 
This is coming from God. Number one, a change that makes the change, the turning around, the transformation in your life. It says the kindness of God. Number two, and the love of God, our Savior toward man. This agent that comes, the love of God, the love of God for the unlovable, the love of God for the people who have ruined their lives with hatred. And it says, that's the second agent. Number three, it says mercy. You'll find that in verse five, not by the works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, it says, this is the agent, the kindness, the love, the mercy that comes into our lives. And this is not of your own doing, your own work. Number four is now the washing of regeneration. You find that in verse five. But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, recreation. And reformation, the regeneration. If you you know, if you think about regeneration, you separate the re, and then you have generation, and then you remove the i o n. You have generate. From that, gen that's where you have your generator, and your generator is the one that is producing the energy and producing the electricity and producing the power that then makes everything to work. Regeneration, generate, generator, regeneration. He created you before and he had to do it all over again to reproduce and regenerate a new power, a new form of power in your life. And this is the agent coming from on high. Number five is renewing, new, renew. New, renewal, to renew it and to make it new all over again. It means that, you know, the machine is broken down. And although the machine is there, but there's no engine to make it work. And the body is all dented. And the color has been affected by the climates of the different seasons since that vehicle or that machine was produced and then we take that vehicle it's almost like scrap almost useless almost worthless undesirable unprofitable i cannot do anything and then you take it back to the manufacturer to the maker to the one that did it before and then it begins to work on it and it changes it on the inside there is a new engine it changes the body and touches every part and then it brings it back you see this machinery is new all over again there's a renewal and this is the regeneration and the renewal by the holy ghost that the lord is telling us is going to do in our lives i said it will do in our lives then the sixth agent, how lie about this verse says, which is shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That's the very nucleus of all the agents gathering everything together. The Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Number seven, you're going to find that in verse seven. That be justified by his grace all coming through grace it's telling us look at the past the seven things that destroyed our lives in the past look at the present and look at the change and look at the seven agents that we've got the past life now is forgotten the past is forgiven the present life of the believer is new and radically different we should forget the past and focus on the present. Satan, sin, self ruined the past. But God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit, they act actively, creatively, dynamically, in a transforming way within us to regenerate and to renew us in the present. The problem with some people is that they still remember the former things and they think so much of the former things until the past overwhelms them and the past overcomes them. Again, let us go off the past. 
even in our thoughts. Let us present, let the present, the new renewed life shine and grow without any hindrance, without any rival. The new has taken over and the old will be forgotten. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, the regeneration of man by the Savior. The regeneration of man by the Savior. Number two, the renewal of our inner man by the Holy Spirit. The renewal of our inner inward man by the Holy Spirit. Number three, the revelation of the inheritance of the saints. The revelation of the inheritance of the saints. We come to number one. Number one, the regeneration of man by the Savior in Titus chapter 3 verse 4. Titus chapter 3. What do you need from verse 4 and also from verse 4? Five Titus three four and five, but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing renewal of the Holy Ghost. The washing of regeneration. I told you already that word rendered regeneration means a new birth, a reproduction, a recreation, a renewal. This generation, the new birth or the recreation takes place not by our works of righteousness, which we have done, which any man can ever do, but by God's mercy. By God's love, by God's grace, by God's power. We have no good works to present to God to purchase salvation. We have no good works to present to God to make this regeneration, recreation, to make it possible. Before God in his mercy saved us, all our so-called good works, good deeds was tinged with pride. All our so-called good works were stained with selfish motives. All our so-called good works were stained and spoiled by self-interest, by insincerity, by hypocrisy. On the surface, they might appear to be good. They might look like good works. But when you closely examine the things we did, before we came to know the Lord, before the Lord grabbed us, took hold of us, and washed us, and cleansed us, and transformed us by his mercy. When you closely examine those things under heaven's eyes, under God's all-seeing eyes, they are worthless counterfeits. No, the works of carnal men, condemned men, cannot be the basis of receiving eternal life, only the work of Christ can purchase the new life, eternal life for man. That's why it says, by the washing of regeneration. Now let's come to Job chapter 25. In Job chapter 25, reading from verse 4, Job 25. And I'm reading from verse 4. How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? You can't do that yourself. You cannot cleanse yourself, save yourself, regenerate yourself. No man can do that for himself and no man can do it for another man. It has to come through the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 12. Isaiah 57 verse 12. I will declare thy righteousness and thy works for they shall not profit thee. All those things, you know, there are people that will pride themselves in giving monies to the needy. 
and helping the beggars on the street and building community hall for the communities and then creating good roads for people in rural areas and then they have raised up this and raised up this those things are good but if you depend upon them for salvation if you depend upon them for life eternal if you depend upon them to be acceptable presentable before the majesty of God that will never do and it says over there you've seen it yourself Isaiah 57 and there in verse 12 I will declare thy righteousness that you, have, that you are boasting about I will declare thy works that you are flaunting before everybody everywhere for they shall not profit thee you need something more than that you need the cleansing the washing of regeneration that God does by some power in first Corinthians chapter 6 first Corinthians chapter 6 I'm reading from verse 9 it says know ye not that the righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Then you say, what are we going to do then? Because that whole, just that list there takes in everybody, everybody on earth. In Africa and in Asia, in Europe and in America, the white and the black, the educated and the illiterate, this one takes in everybody. And it says, whether you fornicate or idolater, adulterer or the effeminate, or abusers of themselves with mankind, or thieves, or covetous, or drunkard, or revilers, all those people, they cannot hear the kingdom of God. What are we going to do then? So that the kingdom, the kingdom of God will be ours. It tells us in verse 11, it says, and such were some of you, but now ye are washed. The washing, the cleansing. That's what God does. And that is what brings the new life. That is what brings the new hope. That now there is eternal life available. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. And by the spirit of our God. It has to be done by the Lord himself. In Galatians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 16 and also verse 20. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2 verse 16. In verse 16 here is what it says. That knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. A man is not justified by the kind of self-righteousness he can produce. By his own strength, in his own effort. But by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ, in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified, justified by the face of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no man, no flesh be justified. Well then, it is the cleansing, the washing, the act of grace from the Lord through Jesus Christ that grants us that new life. That new life. In verse 20 it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I live. Well, because God uses my tongues to talk. Because God uses my thoughts to think through his own thoughts. Because God uses my feet. I live. He uses my feet to walk to the place he wants me to go. But the energy that does that, the engine that does that, the power that does that is not of me. Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, then when we talk about this regeneration, 
recreation. I will talk about this new birth that produces a new once again. The life of God, the life of Christ in man. It is not the power, the energy, the effort, the struggling of mortal man by himself. It is by the power of the almighty God himself within man. That produces that in James chapter 1. James chapter 1, we're reading from verse 18. James 1 verse 18. Of his own will begat he us or the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures wherefore my beloved brethren let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak slow to wrath for the wrath of man walketh not the righteousness of god wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. The word that acts like water, the water of regeneration to wash, to cleanse, to purge, to purify, to change, to transform and translate you to another lifestyle because of this great work that you could not have accomplished for yourself but which the lord himself accomplishes by himself in his grace in his love in his mercy in first peter chapter 1 verse 23 being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God. Again, it's not by the work of man. It's by the word of God. Then he tells us which lives and abides forever. We're told in 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. That if we have any victory, and thank God we have the victory. And if we have any renewal, thank God there is renewal. That this is by the faith in the Son of God. First John chapter 5 verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. Even our faith, the overcoming life, the renewed life. The victorious life, the life that is no more lived under those seven things, is no more lived in foolishness, is no more lived in deception, is no more lived in disobedience, is no more lived in envy or jealousy, is no more lived in malice, is no more lived in hatred. The life that is new, the life that overcomes all the systems of the world, it says that life we have it by the faith in the Son of God. In verse 18 of that same chapter 5, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches him not. And let's come back to uh, this Titus again, Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5 once again. It says, but after that the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. By the washing of regeneration. The washing of regeneration. And there, there are, you know, some... A Christian, in quotes, Christian bodies, organizations that teach that here you are, that if you really want to be born again, come to them and then they will baptize you in water. That it is that water baptism that actually brings renewal, regeneration. And then they will refer to this one and say, by the washing of regeneration. The question then is, 
from the revelation of scripture, the revelation of the New Testament, is water baptism the means of cleansing and purifying the soul from sin. What does the Bible say? Is it true, like men, like these people are saying, what they call regenerate, baptismal regeneration? That is, if you are going to have this regeneration, this renewal, this change of life, this victory over sin, over self, over Satan, is it going to be by the water baptism that they conduct or anybody conducts that you have that renewal, that regeneration? There is nothing in scripture that teaches that baptismal regeneration. Christ forgives. Christ transforms. Christ cleanses. Not with water, but with his own blood. Christ regenerates and transforms our lives. Not with water, but with his own precious blood. Matthew chapter 26 in Matthew chapter 26, we're reading from verse 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, the New Covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Not water baptism. This is my blood, which is shed for the remission of the sins of many. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood, not the water, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from sin. And then it goes on in Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness. And the first begotten of the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Washed us from our sins in his own blood. It's the blood, the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus. You need a renewal. You come to pray and you pray to the Lord. And then you appeal to the Lord that because of the blood that has been shed for you on the cross of Calvary, or renew you, regenerate you, and then transform you, turn your life around. See how somebody prayed in Psalm 51. Psalm 51. I'm reading there from verse 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden parts, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me. Appealing to God. Pleading with God. Praying to God. I need purging, cleansing, purification. Purge me with Esau. And I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Wash me. It might have been enough for David to have said, I want to be as white as snow. But he said, no, I want to go deeper than that, higher than that. I want to be whiter than snow. It says, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities, creating me a clean heart to God and renew a right spirit within me. He does that by that regeneration. Isaiah chapter 1. We need to come to the Lord. And so that he will do that. How can you wash a child that is running away from you? How can you wash a child that is, well, that will not submit to your gentle cleansing hand? The child must submit, must come, must give himself unto the one that wants to cleanse. And if we're going to be cleansed and washed, then we must come to the Lord. And it says over here in chapter 1 of Isaiah verse 16, chapter 1 verse 16, wash you. Make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. You see, you have to stop the old 
and give the new a chance to flourish. You know, the habit might be there. And the bad habit and the past habit might be pulling you back to the old lifestyle. Stop it. Cease to do evil and learn to do well. Teach your mouth to say new things and teach your hands to form new actions and teach your mind to think new thoughts and teach your eyes to see a new direction. It's a process of learning. And when that grace of God comes upon you, learn to do well. Seek judgment as justice. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as white as they shall be as wool. The Lord will do it. But you see, is the one that does it. You have a part to play. You need to cooperate with, with him. And you need to cooperate with the Almighty so that what he intends to do, the regeneration, will take effect in your heart, in your life. In James chapter 4, verse 8. James chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 8. Draw near to God. And he will, he will draw near unto you. Take the initiative. You need something from the Lord. You want to be better than you are today. You want to be whiter than you have ever been. You want a holier life. You want a life that is more pleasing unto the Lord. Take the initiative. Draw near unto God. And he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Ye double-minded. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. The steps will take so that the holiness that's already there will become greater, higher, deeper, broader. And then it will be applied to every area of our lives. In, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1. Having therefore these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. And of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We come to point number two now. The renewal of our inward man by the Holy Spirit. The renewal of the inward man by the Holy Spirit. The Lord can do it. And the Lord has started the process already. We we'll look at Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. And we're looking at uh, verse uh, 5 and verse 6. Not by the works of righteousness. Which we have done. But according to his mercy. He saved us. By the washing of regeneration. And the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Have you noticed as you start from verse 4. At the end of verse 4, that word appeared. There is no full stop. It's still continuing. It's still connecting everything. It's talking about the overall turning around, transformation, overhauling, renewal, regeneration for the whole man. And it's telling us in the process of doing that, of perfecting that in our lives, a lot of things come into place. And we considered one, the regeneration. That's part of it. Now we're considering the renewal of the inward man. The renewal of the real person within. I'm sure you know that your mouth, whatever it says, not just because of the shape of your mouth, but because of the condition of your heart. The substance in your heart. I'm sure you know that your hands, when you move your hands, it's not just that your hand is moving independently. It is the condition and the substance in the heart. I'm sure you know that when you are walking somewhere, decide you are taking action, all those actions of the members of the body, they are not because of the independent strengths and energy and planning of those members of the body is the substance in the heart and that's the inner man that's the personality within if the inward man is changed 
Then the outward man will act according to the stature, the spirituality of the inward man. That's why we need the renewal of the inward man by the purging, the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit within is the Spirit of God. The inner man, that, that's the real, that's the real thing. That's, in fact, in fact, is the inner man that attracts, that attracts whatever it is to us. Uh, you know, sometimes, have you ever thought about it? You are thinking of somebody, uh, you know, as we're here in the Congress. Uh, I've not seen Brother So, while you are thinking of him, he just appears. I, I was just thinking about you. It's the inner man. There is what the inner man attracts. And then, have you, have you noticed when you're very happy and joyful? And then, as, as your inner man is happy and joyful, ideas are coming to you. This year, I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. It's the inner man that produces that. Have you ever thought about it? It's something that, you know, you went to work last week and when you were doing that work, it appears everything was sure. It wasn't all right. Is it because your hands are not skillful? Is it because you don't know how to do it? No. It's a condition of your inner man. You are thinking of something else. You are sad. You are unhappy. And because of that, the inner man was not ready to work. Although the hands are skillful, yet the inner man, the condition of the inner man and then something happens they came to give you news did you know you were not in the place of work last friday no i wasn't there already i was preparing to come to the congress do you know that they have promoted some people and then now i'm surprised they put you on this you say what well, are you telling me the truth are you just fully i'm telling i'm a christian how can i tell you something not true they have promoted you and then anything you do for a few minutes after that because of the condition of the earth you do it so well they say ah Look at this man. Look at this person. He did something shoddy last week. Something you cannot present to another person. See the way he's walking now. He's the inner man. That's why if the inner man is renewed. If the inner man has a purging. A change. A transformation. Your outward expression. Everything is going to become different. The Lord is walking on the inner man. The renewal. The regeneration. The transformation. The turning around of that inner man so that everything you produce this year will be of the best quality in second corinthians chapter 4 verse 16 second corinthians chapter 4 and i'm reading from verse 16 here it says for we for which cause for which reason we faint not but though our outward man perish yet the inward man is renewed day by day day after day the inward man is renewed that renewal let's, let's turn to uh, ephesians chapter 4 verses 23 and 24 ephesians chapter 4 verse 23 and verse 24 and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that's that in a man again. When your mind is renewed, your mind is re be renewed in the spirit of your of your mind, and th and that he put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Already you know that the word renew is to make new again. Renewal or renovation is the act of a work of making something new. New, totally new. This renewal is a supernatural change produced by the Spirit of God in the soul. The Holy Spirit so works in mighty power that He makes new and renewed everything that we have. What are the things that become renewed? As the Holy Spirit works within us and it works in us on us. Number one, our desires become new. The things you desired before, all of a sudden, life has value. And then you begin to think, the desires of the old time has led me to the destination where I am now. I don't like this destination. I don't like where I am now. Well, if you want to change where you are, I don't mean physically, I don't mean physical location. If you want to change the level where you are, your profitability to humanity, 
you change the desires. How can you change your desires yourself? The Holy Ghost comes and renews you. And all of a sudden, now you have new desires. Number two, you have new hopes. New hopes. Now you have this hope and this. No more rotting of lively hope. Number three, a new purpose. A new purpose. A new goal. A new dream. Because there is a renewed man. And the inward man is always, is always reaching for the best. It's always reaching for the highest. Whatever you do. Any moment you're doing it because of this renewal there is a new purpose number four new plans new plans here is the goal here is the dream here is the destination and because that is the new destination i am running after what is the action plan that will lead me to the new destination because you know the old road will not lead to the new destination. It is the new road that is going to lead unto the new destination. You have new plans of action. And then number five, new thoughts. New thoughts is the thought that produces the action. Is the action when you multiply, repeat that a number of times that produces the habit. Is the habit when you are entrenching it that produces the character. Is the character that produces the destiny. And because she you know the thoughts, that's where everything starts. The thoughts, and then the action, and then the habit. And then the character. And then the destiny. Because you want a glorious destiny, you must touch with a glorious thought. And then because of this renewal that now comes, there are new thoughts and then new affection. New affection. The things you are attracted to. And the things you have affections in. All those things are renewed because the inward man is renewed. New passions, number seven. New passions, number eight. New pursuit. Everything new. Everything new. Look at what the Bible says. Romans chapter six, we're looking at verse four. Romans chapter six, we're looking at verse four. Therefore, we're buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. When that renewal comes, that's what it does. We walk in newness of life. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 5. First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Put out, therefore, the old leaven. That she may be a new lamb. Let me remove that uh, word leaven and the lamb. And just read it this way. Purge out therefore the old. That she may be new. You know if you don't purge out the old. And just say now old character. Old habit. Let's forget about it. You are buried. You are dead and buried. Otherwise if you have the old and the new, they will be struggling. They will be struggling. The new is new, fresh, it's like a baby. The old is grown and strong. And because the old is strong, if both of them are in the same house, the old being long and aged and strong will destroy in the struggle, in the fight. If the old and the new, if they're in the same house, the old will want to take supremacy. The old will want to take the upper hand. I've been here before you came, you're new. You're a baby virtue. But this one has been long, has been there for a long time, and is strong. Old habits are strong. But the new habit is just a baby habit. It's just a new habit. And if you allow the old to remain, it won't take a week. The effect of the Congress on your life. 
it will not take a week. All the decisions you have taken at the Congress, everything will all be gone. You say, don't you understand? I took my decisions there. There was a really take. You didn't decide that the old will be dead and buried and that you are not going to allow in this house, in this temple, I mean your temple, I mean your body, you are not going to allow the old to survive at all. Once the old survives and remains in the same place with the new, the new has no chance. The new has no chance. It's a baby virtue. That's the reason why you allow just the new, just the new to be there. Don't you remember when Isaac came, Ishmael had to live. Ishmael had to live. The old that were God by the acts of the flesh had to live. Now that I seek will grow up and grow up alone here so that the promise that is made unto the seed of Abraham that seed will be able to enjoy it without any competition just imagine if Ishmael and Isaac were in the same house while Isaac was growing up and daddy and mommy are not around think about the influence that will be on Isaac and Ishmael has to leave. The old has to go. And then the new will have all the chance to blossom and to grow in our lives. That's what makes the difference. You will bury the old. And the new will come alive in Jesus' name. Purge out therefore the old leaven. That she may be a new lamb. I see her on living, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And then we're told in Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42, we're reading from verse 9. Isaiah 42, verse 9. Behold, the former things are come to pass. New things do I declare before the spring forth. I tell you of them. The Lord is bringing up something in your life. A new thing. And this new thing will grow. This renewal is very important. And it makes the believer's life shine brighter and brighter. Until the perfect day. This believer who's inward man is renewed day by day. That he is day after day. is increasing daily. Increasing in number one, love. Increasing in number two, faith. Increasing in, in uh, number three, hope. Increasing in righteousness. Increasing in number five, knowledge. Increasing in number six, wisdom. Increasing in zeal. Increasing in conformity to Christ. Each new day, the Holy Spirit renews the consecration and the conviction and also renews the commitment of that child of God to serve his Lord and King with renewed ability in the use of the whole armor of God knowing that the Holy Spirit is the author of the new life and the daily renewal the child of God trusts the Lord and claims the promises of God yielding himself to the influence of the Holy Spirit in our pilgrimage, in our journey heavenward, we move farther and faster. The old life is out of view. You move so fast that the old life cannot, even if the old life wanted to run after you and catch up with you, impossible again. You've run so fast and you've run so far that the old life is now out of view. And you constantly keep the old permanently out of view that the new life, the new life alone will enjoy conspicuous visibility in your life. And we're looking at Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 10. Colossians chapter 3, we're reading from verse 10. Here it tells us, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarians, Christian, 
bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Actually, you know, if you, in this new year, if you carry the chips on your shoulders, if you carry the hurts in your mind, in your heart, you see, you nail yourself. You see, those hurts and those thoughts about what people have done, when you think about them, have you, have you noticed how your, how your mind slows down, your walking slows down, your energy diminishes when you are thinking about hurts? You see, when you are thinking about hurts, what people did, you'll not let go, you'll not forgive, you are hurting yourself, you are nailing yourself, you are stopping your own onward journey. And then you are thinking of what to do. And when you are thinking of what to do to be able to get even with him. And to be able to retaliate and show him, you cannot reach me like that. When you are thinking like that, you are trying to bring back old habits. And once again, once you bring in the old, the new that you are trying to develop. And the new that the Holy Ghost is bringing up in your life. That new life will suffer. And then when you're thinking of that, you slow down. And instead of thinking of your own progress and thinking of your own success and thinking of your own moving on faster and thinking of improving in the work of the Lord, you'll be thinking on, you know, some negative things. And then it will slow down your own pace and your movement. You'll hurt yourself. And that's why the Lord is saying it's a new year. And you forget everything of the old. Somebody cheated you and so what? And so what? And somebody deprived you of something and so what? and somebody insulted you and so what and somebody assaulted you and so what and somebody persecuted you and so what you give the persecutor strength you give him your valuable time when you think about him and you make yourself his servant you are a servant to the person you are thinking about you are saying so and so he did this to me you are giving him power over your life to control your life but if you say no his heart will not be a string, will not be a cord to tie me down. His heart will not be a chain to tie me down. I don't have any chain. I don't have any hang up. I'm just moving on without thinking about the hearts of the people. That's how we make progress. Go and ask anybody that's able to have concentration. One of our pastors talking yesterday emphasized consecration and concentration. And he hammered on it and hammered on it so that we'll not forget. You go and ask the people that succeeded in life. They consecrate and they said, this one thing I do. And then they concentrate. They don't look here and look there and look back. They just say, I'm not going to allow the hurt of years to years to slow me down. I'm moving on. And then you forgive and you forget. And after that, you're free for action, productive action, purposeful action, progressive action. Look at that verse 12 again, but put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on love, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness but we'll do that i said we'll do that here is the new life and the new life has come to stay in jesus name now in colossians chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 1 if ye then be risen with christ seek those things which are above where christ sits on the right hand of god set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. For ye are dead. And your life is seed with Christ in God. When Christ who is alive shall appear. Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. That is yours. 
I said that is yours. And nothing will take it away from you, from me, from us, in Jesus' name. Number one, the regeneration. Number two, the renewal. Number three now, the revelation of the inheritance of the saints. The revelation of the inheritance of the saints. We're looking at Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. We're looking at verse 7. That being justified by his grace. We should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Justified by his grace. Then we're made heirs. We have an inheritance. Heirs according to the hope of eternal life. To be justified means that now by his grace, by his mercy, you are so forgiven by the Lord and you are regarded as if you had never, never sinned in your life. As if you had never gone astray. Yet God receives the prodigal son back home as if he never wandered away into the far country. That's the mercy of the Lord. That he doesn't remember the past concerning you, concerning us. Justification removes both the sins you have committed and the consciousness of those sins. Removes the sin and the most sin consciousness. God has nothing against the justified. Once the Lord has saved you and he has justified you, he has nothing against the justified. Jesus has paid the full price for our sins. Justice is fully satisfied. There is no record kept of the past sins. God does not look at the justified man, the justified woman as a sinner. You know, it's a, it's a real misconception of the word of God, of grace, of salvation, of adoption into the family of God. It's a misconception of salvation and redemption. It's a misconception of regeneration. It's a misconception of justification by faith. For any preacher, not preachers here, the preachers here, they are more knowledgeable than that. For any preacher in any church to come before their congregation and say, well, thank God I'm saved. Thank God, I know that I'm acceptable to the Father, but I want to tell you, George, I'm still a sinner. Although I'm a sinner, a little bit different from the people outside, but I'm still a sinner. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. You know, there are people that will say that and talk like that. As if salvation does not bring victory. As if salvation does not bring freedom. As if salvation does not bring liberty to live in the grace of God and in the glory of the sin of the cross that sets us free. When you become a child of God, you're no more just a sinner saved by grace. All those sins are forgiven and forgotten and they do not have any hold on your life anymore. That's why the New Testament refers to those who are justified as saints, saints, things are different now. Something has happened to you. And the chains of the old sin, they are not bound on your waist, on your heart, on your legs anymore. Dragging you back to live in the old life. Justice is fully satisfied. And there is no record kept of the past sins. And God does not look as the justified as a sinner. Change your language. Change your thoughts. He is not dragging his past along with him. Through life till the end of life. The father has received the prodigal son back. And he does not bring his past life before him or before others at any time. That is, that is what it means to be justified. And he has received us as his children and made us heirs of all that he possesses. And he says, all that I have is yours. He has given us hope that we shall live with him forever. And let's look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 14. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. 
And then in verse 16, the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so, be that he will suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. We're now heirs of God. And we inherit everything that belongs to the Father. Together with the Lord Jesus Christ, we become joint heirs. Galatians chapter 3 verse 26. Galatians chapter 3 verse 26. For ye are all, children, all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed. And heirs, you inherit something. Heirs according to the promise. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26. Acts, chapter 26, reading from verse 18. Acts 26, verse 18, to open their eyes. Our eyes need to be opened. So we will see the provision Christ has made for us as a result of the death of Christ, of the death he died for us on the cross of Calvary. The inheritance we have as a result of the provision coming through the cross through Calvary unto every believer to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they might receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance that they, those who are saved, that day, those who are justified, that day, those who have the adoption into the family of God, that day, those who have the redemption through the blood of the Lamb, that day may receive an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me, that is in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 15. Ephesians 1 verse 15 Wherefore I also after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus And love unto all the saints Cease not to give thanks for you Making mention of you in my prayers That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ The Father of glory May give unto you the spirit of wisdom This year you'll be wiser than you were last year and the revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that she may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That's what he has done. He has given us an inheritance and then the Holy Ghost comes to open our eyes of understanding that we may see, that we may know what we possess, what we have, what is ours in the Lord. Colossians chapter 1 verse 12. Colossians chapter 1 verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which have made us meet to be partakers of of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has made us fit. He has made us meet. Now he has qualified us by his grace. That will become partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness. We are delivered already. Delivered from the power of darkness. And then he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. When did that happen? In verse 14. In whom we have redemption. Not that we're going to have. We have it already. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sins. And then we have eternal inheritance reserved for us in heaven. And we're going to endure to the end. And we're going to claim that eternal inheritance in Jesus' name. 
First Peter chapter 1. In First Peter chapter 1, we're reading from verse 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, always remember that, it's through the mercy of God, through the grace of God, through the kindness of God, through the love of God, which through his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. And if that inheritance is reserved in heaven for us, we need to endure to the end so that that inheritance will be ours, will be mine, will be yours in Jesus' name. Revelation now, chapter 21 from verse 3. Revelation chapter 21. Reading from verse 3, Revelation 21, from verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Are you God's people? Praise God you are. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. I needed an amen there. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make how many things new? All things new. You know, if you can just uh, have all that renewal, total renewal, that even today, even today, at this time, in this present generation, before the Almighty God makes all the whole universe new, if he can make your own universe new, before he makes the whole of the earth new, if he can make you on earth new, before he renews the surface of the earth and the ocean and the rivers and he renews everything on earth, if you can say, Lord, what you want to do in the time to come, don't you remember Enoch? The rapture is still future. And God said, Enoch, what I'm reserving for the future. And I'm going to do for the whole body of believers as an entity. What I'm still going to do for them in the future. I'll do it for you, Enoch, as a single person. And then Elijah, the rapture that he took part in. That it was just his at that time. Here was, here was Elisha and they were walking together and then God was telling Elijah, you know Elijah, the rapture is not for this generation that you belong to. The rapture is not for this age you belong to. The rapture is not for the time of the prophets. It's for the very time of the end. But Elijah, because of the relationship you have for me, what I'm still intending to do. For the whole of the Christian body in the future, I will do it for you, just for you. And Elisha was looking at him like this, and then instead of a grave, instead of a sepulchre, instead of saying like they said for everybody, and he fell asleep, and they laid him in the tomb like his fathers, and he joined his fathers, like they say in the Old Testament, but he didn't go through that truth. The Lord said, the rapture that is still to come, I'll give it to just you. And then Elijah went to and then Elisha said my father my father the chariot of Israel you know the rest of the story he can do it for you today that what the Lord is still going to do in the future behold I make all things new and you're saying oh Lord what was still to do for the world to come when you're going to renew the whole surface of the universe of the earth you want to do it for me today and Lord I'm waiting for that I wonder today everything within me my, my thoughts my plans my actions 
my language and my everything, my character, my conduct, and my relationship, my interaction, my response to people, my reaction when people do things that are not convenient. I want you to make all things new in my life. The Lord will do it. So when you get back home, your children they play the same pranks they used to play because they didn't come to the congress, their children. And then instead of reacting the same old way, everything is new. And then your wife, uh, you know, the way she normally does, she wants to make sure every, the, the whole, all the plate is clean and the sink is clean and the kitchen, everything. And you say, uh, sister, I'm waiting. Or oh, dear, honey, okay, that's what you call your wife. Honey, I am waiting. I'm waiting for, I'm coming. Uh, you know, in the past, you say, are you going to clean the whole kitchen before we eat? I'm hungry. Hunger is trying to, you know, take her husband away from you. And then, you know, in the past, you might say some things that your husband, that your wife say, okay, I'm coming. And then run. I don't want trouble in this house again. But today, after after this Congress, if the food is late, you know, your wife, you know, some, I, the wives who are here will not do that. But, you know, some of those people at home, you say, now he has gone to the Congress and they say that they get something new I'm going to test him to know whether he got something new and if the food is clean and everything is alright and then deliberately she's you know, they are not here, those people are here, I will not do that deliberately she's waiting expecting that you, you know talk like you used to talk ah, how long now and then she's expecting, you know, say how long you're just, you know, whistling and you're singing, just rejoicing, congress, congress, new life, <laughs> new life, everything. And then she says, my husband got something new. My wife got something new. And that's what the Lord is saying now, behold, I make all things new. I want to be a partaker. I want to be a partaker. So that on the street, in the bus, in the taxi, in the plane, with your wife, with your children, with everybody, they will say, Daddy got something new. Mommy got something. Then you come to church. You come to church next Sunday. Your hallelujah is new. Your singing is new. Your interaction with your congregation, everything is new. And then come and see growth in your church. Come and see the testimony you are going to tell. And next year, those of us will be here next year, wherever we are, I'm telling you, testimonies upon testimonies. Behold, I make all things new. Rise up and receive. Rise up and receive. Behold, I make all things new. He wants to do it in your life, my brother. He wants to do it in your life, my sister. We have agents of transformation. To transform your life. To transform your life. To turn everything around in the positive. My brother, my sister, he has done it already. Give him glory. Give him thanks. Give him praises. What he does. And say, Lord, here am I. Here am I. Accomplish it in my life. The old is dead. The old is buried. Bury the dead. If the old dies, you don't bury it, it stinks. And its stench will not allow you to enjoy the new. If the old is truly dead, then you have to bury it. You have to bury it so that the stench, the odor will not hinder your experience or enjoyment of the new. And don't allow the old to stay, to reside in the same heart, in the same life, in the same house, or the old, or with the new. Because the old will struggle and fight and conquer. The new, the new is like a baby. Give the new all the chance to develop and to grow. And say, Lord, the old must totally be forgotten. You move so fast and run so far that the old is out of view. You're on the race so fast and you get so far. You lose sight of the old. 
The old is out of view. You are regenerated. You are renewed. And then this new life is so great, is so wonderful, that it now begins to grow, moving on and moving fast. New life, new thoughts, new action, new habits, new character, new destiny, new lifestyle, new conduct, new behavior, new interaction, new relationship, new response. If you are thinking about retaliation, fighting back, you nail yourself. You stop yourself from progressing. And if you indulge in negative thinking, negative thinking will become entrenched in your life. You'll not be thinking about your own progress. You'll just be thinking about how to deal with others, how to handle others, how to retaliate, how to revenge, how to react, how to do this, how to do that. Your life will be a way thinking about other people. Are you going to hinder them? Are you going to hurt them? Are you going to harm them? Are you going to stop their onward journey? You will not make progress. Then you'll just be there. But if you think in a positive way. And you leave all the others alone. You have a life to develop. And you have a goal you want to reach. You have a destination you are focused on. And you say, I forget about other people. I'm going somewhere. I want to get that done. That's what makes life enjoyable. That's what makes life profitable. That's what makes life progressive. And you allow the agency of the spirit, of the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb, the agency of the promise of God, of the power of the Lord to walk in your life. And that's what makes, that's what gives excitement to life. That's what gives exuberance, energy, enthusiasm to life. And then you're able to move on. And then this year becomes better, richer, greater, more profitable than the previous years. The regeneration, the renewal of the Holy Spirit and the revelation that the Lord is giving us now of our inheritance. Present that before the Lord and say, Lord, things are going to be different, are going to be new in this new year. Everything new. Everything new. The inner man is renewed day by day. Character, habit, lifestyle renewed day by day. You're better today than you were yesterday. You're better this week than you were last week. You're better this month than you were last month. Then that makes this year better. And last year, renewal, refreshing, regeneration. And walk by the revelation the Lord has given you now. Let him make all things new. Let him make all things new. All things new in your heart, in your life, in your habit, in, in every action. All things new. A new pattern, profitable pattern. A new model, profitable model. A new attitude, profitable attitude. A new relationship, profitable relationship. A new thought, profitable thought. You're thinking about your life. You want to move forward. You want to make progress. Be progressive this year. Let everything be new. Rely on the power of the Holy Ghost so that everything in your life will be totally new. Then the whole body of Christ that know you, they will be giving thanks and praises to God on your behalf. All things new. Think about your ministry. All things new. Think about your cooperation with leadership. 
all things new. Think about your respect for your overseers, for your pastors, all things new. Think about your talk, about your conversation in your families about other believers all things new think about your commitment your concentration on the work of the lord all things new think about your attitude to members of the church all things new think about your uh, sacrifice in the work of the lord all things new think about your faithfulness in your tithes and offering all things new think about your relationship to your wife all things new think about your fellowship and your faithfulness to your husband all things new think about your dedication to personal development and personal growth all all things new. The procrastination of the past is gone. And the laziness of the past is gone. And the old habits that will pull you back and draw you back from the line and from the direction of progress, all that is gone. Behold, I make all things new. Let him do it in your life. And let that new life take over. Let that new life take over. A new understanding, enlightened eyes, a new commitment, a new consecration, a new surrender, a new devotedness, a new yieldedness, a new, new relationship in everything that you do. Behold, I make all things new. Let him make everything new in your life. A new courage, a new conviction, a new commitment, new. And give the Lord a chance to make your whole universe new. Make your whole universe new. That you'll never be the same again. And then you allow the spirit of the Lord to renew you day after day. Day after day. Day after day. Allow the Spirit of God, the cleansing blood, the mighty name of Jesus, the never failing creative word of God. Allow that to make you new, completely new, until the old is forgotten. Until the old is out of sight. Until the old is completely out of view. That now things are new and you are thanking the Lord. And people around you are praising the Lord, glorifying the name of the Lord. That now you are not the old man you used to be. Or the old character you used to portray. Or the old reactions you used to portray. But now things are definitely new in your life. New in your heart. New in your home. New with members of your family. New in your church. All things new. New faith. New love. New hope new trust new confidence new trustworthiness new completely new completely new totally new within and without within and around your brain now walks in a new direction And you become more profitable to leadership. More profitable to the church, to the ministry. More supportive of the growth and the progress of the church. And make all things new. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you because of your revelation. The revelation that when you take hold of us 
And then you purge, you purify, you regenerate, you renew. That things will no more be the same as they were. A new life, a new hope, a new vision, a new direction, and a new motive, and a new habit, and a new character, and eventually a new destiny. Lord, we pray you grant every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, according to your promise and your purpose and your plan, that behold, you make all things new. We'll see that newness this year in every life in Jesus' name. In all our leaders, in their administration, in their authority and unction, in their effectiveness, or none of our overseers and pastors will see something new in Jesus' name. All our workers, all our members, in cooperation with their leaders in the local church, in cooperation with their overseers in their region, in their states, and in their nations, there will be a new relationship, a new submission, and a new cooperation, a new faithfulness, a new loyalty in Jesus' name. That the way we have walked and related in the past will not be the way we continue, but this year we'll see something new. And then there'll be new exploits. There'll be new experiences. There'll be new power. And there'll be new effectiveness in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, all the dry desert will blossom. There'll be rivers in the desert. Miracles in the wilderness. That, Lord, will be hearing of one another. Good news, good news in Jesus' name. All the old negative thoughts, all the old negative phoning one another, talking about our leaders, the old story, old story, all that will be no more. Whatever we have, whatever we have, our thought, our tongue, our mouth, our energy, our knowledge, our vision, our gifts, our talent, our telephone, our whatever, our email, whatever. Everything we have will use to the profit of the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. That Lord, all other churches will know, with, even within this month, within this month, they will know something new is happening in that deeper life. And in the revival that will come. That when our leaders stand up like this, something new we have never seen in the local church will begin to happen. All these miracles that these our overseers are sharing while they are preaching, oh Lord, multiply them in the hands of your ministers in all the locations in Jesus' name. And then the love and the unity and the respect and the honor we have for one another in the church from the preacher to the people, from the people to the preacher. Oh Lord, I pray everything will be totally new this year in Jesus' name. Unity, fellowship, togetherness, you'll grant unto us. And then the blessings will flow down to everybody. Our children will do well. Our youths will do well. Our campus students will do well. And Lord, everywhere we are, we will be on top of the ladder. You'll make your people from the preachers to the people on the pew, you make everyone the head and not the tail. That this year, this year, little preaching and then many, many great results. And then little effort like this, it will be yielding a harvest of miracles. And all this, my sisters, Lord, bless them. And whatever they are asking for, you know the promises you have given them this year, wipe all their tears away. And all these, my brothers, their husbands, and those who ought to be, have been husbands, but, you know, something delayed them and tied them back in the past. Lord, I remove all that hurdle. And all the bottleneck, everything is gone in Jesus' name. The evangelism will do this year will prosper. Everything will just turn to success in our hands. And all these uh, full-time workers, you know, they are out, retreat time, they are there. Congress, they are there. No time to rest and no vacation, nothing. Lord, I pray, do something for them they'll never forget. That will bless everybody beyond our expectation in Jesus' name. Bless everyone, Lord. Nobody to go out of here empty-handed. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name. I'm so excited.
excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. I'll be graduating in May. I didn't 